This is Neil Schneider for MTBS TV. I'm at GDC 2015. To my immediate right is Neil Trevitt. He's the president of the Kronos Group as well as vice president of the, the mobile ecosystem for NVIDIA. Did I get that right? That's right. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> okay, with a title like that, I can't imagine what your business card looks like. <laughs> it's long. It's about six inches long. <laughs> Well, for those who, who aren't familiar, can you fill us in as to what Kronos Group is? Yes. Kronos is an open standards organization. We're um, a non-profit. We have around 120 companies, every, everyone from Google and Apple and Intel all the way down to individual developers. And we come together to create the APIs that lets software get to cool hardware acceleration. You've been with Kronos forever. <laughs> how did how did it come to be? Well, you know, it actually started um, with creating a video editing API, uh, but the first uh, standard that really took off was OpenGL ES, which was bringing 3D to mobile phones, and that's now become pervasive. It's basically shipping on every mobile phone uh, in the world, so it's you know, literally billions of devices are using Kronos APIs every day. And I always say that like Kronos, of course, is one of the most reputable op open standards groups in the world. Um, you, you know, but people, uh, the term open is used regularly. Right. And I don't know if there's actually a formal definition behind what it means to be an open standard. Can you elaborate as to what that is? Sure. Well, the, the first thing, most people get confused between open standards and open source. And open source is where you are sharing code in it with a community. Uh, an open standard is a more rigorous process where a group of companies come together, they create a specification which defines how a piece of hardware is going to act, and it, it's very precisely defined, and you have conformance tests, and everyone agrees to uh, follow that specification, and so you get re hopefully reliable operation of hardware functionality, even if multiple people implement it. So it's a bit more rigorous than open source. Now, an open standards organization like Kronos, we often use open source too to enable the ecosystem, but our primary work product is um, no, specifications that people can follow. Now, are, are there responsibilities to being an open standard? Like, are there criteria that need to be met to be defined as an open standard? Well, in my view, I think um, the most important one is that no one company is in control. And so the governance body, in which case, in this case, it's the Kronos Group, the membership, you know, everyone has an equal vote and an equal say. So you know, a specification can't suddenly disappear if, or get changed if a single company kind of changes direction. Um, you know, it's, it's an open process uh, that everyone is welcome to join and everyone has an equal voice and equal vote. And then the second part of it is that the uh, specification is made openly available. Um, and in our case, it's royalty free, so people can implement the spec without needing to pay a royalty. Is it important for an organization like yours to be non-profit? I mean, was there a reason why it's formed as a non-profit versus something else? Yeah, we're very successfully a non-profit. <laughs> the, now, we do have membership dues, but that's you know, because we have work to do. I mean, a non-profit doesn't mean you don't have any money, necessarily. Um, it means that you're not trying to make a profit for your shareholders. And I think that's appropriate for an open standards organization that is not trying to make a profit for itself. It's trying to grow the industry so you know, uh, members and other uh, companies within the industry you know, can benefit as a whole. We kind of lift uh, the industry up with a rising tide. Uh, we, we're not in it to make a profit, so we're in it to make a profit for our, our members in the industry. Now, uh, if, as far as the industry is concerned, I mean, we're at GDC, uh, you know, obviously a huge conference this year. Mm -hmm. What are the big announcements from Kronos this year? Uh, we have three big announcements uh, here at GDC. Um, probably the one that's getting most um, uh, notice is Vulkan. This was the API that was previously known as Next Generation OpenGL. It's uh, a modern API for very uh, explicit, low-level, detailed access to GPU hardware. Um, it's a ground-up redesign. It's the first one in almost 25 years. So uh, we figured we should update our API architecture every quarter century, you know, whether we need to or not. <laughs> um, but that's why we chose a different name without Open or GL in the name, because we wanted to indicate with the name that this is a, a clean break. Um, so it's getting a good response. Uh, people seem to like the direction. But you know, the other important thing is OpenGL and OpenGLES, the existing APIs, they're not going away. You know, they're actually in their prime in terms of pervasiveness. And so they're going to be 
maintained and evolved, I think, for actually many years to come. And, you know, but now we have a new API that gives the choice to developers who want low-level access to the GPU for absolute maximum performance and flexibility. You know, uh, Vulkan is uh, the API that fits that bill. So that's announcement one. What's announcement two? Now, announcement two is related to Vulkan, which is Spear V. Now, we've had an intermediate representation. This is kind of one key compiler talk, but it's actually in some ways, I actually think this is going to be the thing that changes the ecosystem more than anything. Uh, it's quite significant. Most compilers, they have a front end, which does all the syntax processing on a language like C or C++, and then the back end, which is actually generating the machine code to run on the hardware. And most compilers, they have like an intermediate language in the middle, so you can innovate on the top and the bottom independently. The key thing about Spear V is that now we have a standard intermediate representation that goes across multiple vendors and across multiple APIs. So uh, the new version of OpenCL and Vulkan, they both use the uh, Spear V, the new version of the intermediate representation, to um, as an intermediate representation. So now we can have multiple languages and multiple frameworks that are doing language processing emitting Spear V and hardware vendors does have to ingest Spear V code and run it optimally so we can enable parallel um, innovation in the language software domain and in the hardware runtime domain. So, like it crosses APIs? Is that the yes, it's the same. same. Now, there's some differences because at the moment OpenCL is a compute API and Vulkan is primarily a graphics API, although there is compute there as well. Um, but yes, we are essentially sharing the same uh, IR. This is the first time the industry has had a uh, standard portable IR that uh, handles both graphics and parallel computation. Uh, LLVM, again, for the compiler people out there, I know you'd recognize LLVM. <laughs> uh, LLVM is a very well-known uh, intermediate representation for CPU uh, compilers. Um, and we love LLVM, and we can convert between uh, LLVM and Spear V. But Spear V is um, totally defined by Kronos for graphics and parallel computation, uh, so we can cope with those APIs. Okay, so that's two announcements. What's announcement number three? <laughs> announcement three. I've been counting, you see. <laughs> yeah, not le letting me off the hook here. So uh, the third one is OpenCL 2.1. So it's a new version of OpenCL. Uh, it's in provisional form because we're looking for industry feedback. So if you're out there and, and you like OpenCL, please give us feedback. Um, the two big ticket items are Spear V. It supports Spear V. So now we can import all this goodness from the language community. Uh, and one of those languages that we support is C++. Uh, so we can now write parallel kernel code, not just in C, that we did before. Uh, we can still do that. It's backwards compatible. But we have now C++ as a new language for the new OpenCL. Now, for those who aren't familiar, so OpenGL is pretty much an API for graphics rendering, mm -hmm. but OpenCL is a completely different ballgame altogether, right? right? Can you elaborate what OpenCL is? Because I don't think people yes. necessarily realize. Yes, so uh, G for graphics, OpenGL, C for compute, OpenCL. So uh, whereas OpenGL and Vulkan are primarily APIs for driving a GPU, um, primarily graphics. So Vulkan has, uh, well, OpenGL has com some compute, compute shaders. Vulkan has compute as well. Um, but OpenCL is an unashamedly compute uh, framework for heterogeneous parallel programming. What that means is that you can not just use the GPU, you can use any processors and all the processors in the system. You can use your multi core CPUs, you can use one or more GPUs, DSPs if you have them, and many mobile phones do now. Uh, FPGAs now have backends for, for OpenCL, even hardware blocks. You can use all of these different hard types of processor through one unified framework, which is OpenCL. Uh, so for the first time, you can generate a program that has a single source file, and yet can dynamically uh, find out what processes are in a system and you know, deploy the kernels across them. Okay, now Vulkan, mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, it, it, the timing is a little, it's a bit of a mixed blessing. And fortunately, as Leonard Nimoy passed on, yeah, was sad. was there was there anything to do with that to name it Vulkan? No, no. The, so uh, Kronos, it's the name Kronos is actually a Roman deity, uh, the god of time. Um, 
cunningly misspelt with a K, and Vulcan is the same thing. Vulcan is the god of fire and forge, so uh, Vulcan is all about industrial strength, power and speed. Um, that's why uh, we chose the name Vulcan. And we, mis you know, we carried our proud tradition of misspelling deities with a K into the future. <laughs> I understand that there are certain benefits with the Vulcan uh, API, you know, for virtual reality and immersive technology. C yes. Can you speak to that? The whole point of uh, Vulcan is to extract the maximum power out of the hardware that you have. So uh, I think the first wave of developers that will find it kind of irresistible to use are going to be the games engines developers. So a lot of VR people I know are developing with you know, Epic and Unity engines. Those are the kind of engines that are going to find themselves able to extract uh, a lot of performance from a very diverse set of uh, platforms using the Vulkan API. So uh, was it done to reduce latency with content? Like what, like what input did you get out of, when I say you, I mean Kronos, did they get out of the likes of, let's say, Oculus and Valve and so on? Was there a lot of input there? The, 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 key, thing, um, the th key thing we couldn't solve with the traditional OpenGL architecture in a way that the developers really wanted to use going forward was multi-threading. Um, Op OpenGL, the act of creating work and getting it down to the GPU is like one big atomic blob. Um, but Vulkan splits that. So now we can have as many threads as you want across uh, potentially multiple CPUs, creating work in parallel with the GPU, and you have another thread doing the sub submission. So everything from mo mobile phones to supercomputers, you know, we have a much more multi-threading uh, capability. But in addition to that, it's a much lower level API. The, the GPU is kind of laid out there for you to you know, use as flexibly as you want. There's a lot less um, error checking and context management built into the driver. So the application has a lot more control and in the hands of the right uh, programmers who want that level of control, you, know, you can get a lot more flexibility and a lot more performance. Now, there's OpenGL and then you've got the proprietary option uh, DirectX, mm -hmm. like through, through Microsoft. Yeah. From what I've seen, Valve is taking a very big OpenGL direction. Um, is there a strategic importance uh, for Valve to use OpenGL versus anything else? Well, you need to talk to Valve about that. But I think I mean, DirectX is obviously going to be a significant uh, API uh, on, on Windows. And the interesting thing is that you know, both DirectX 12 and Vulkan have made the jump to this modern, explicit, lower level API at the same time. It's not surprising because you know, the GPU architectures are the same, we're solving the same problems, we've kind of ended up in the same uh, design space. Um, but I think, you know, again, the, the big difference between DX12 and Vulkan is that Vulkan is going to be available across many different platforms, including older versions of Windows, which for some markets is actually quite interesting, because you know, DX12 will need to ship on Windows 10, whereas Vulkan, anywhere that OpenGL can ship, including all the way back to Windows XP, you know, Vulkan should be able to ship too. So we can enable you know, the latest functionality on older, older PC systems. So I heard you speak about this earlier, so I'm going to bring it up. You know, you could have a world where there's proprietary standards, you could have a world where there's op you know, open standards, and then you could have both. Yes. Which one would you prefer to see and why? Well, I think in the real world, you actually need both. Um, you always need competition to push the state of the art forward. And so all successful open standards actually do have you know, good, healthy competition with proprietary standards. The first people to get to market and you know, uh, create a proprietary API are doing the right business thing by you know, keeping, keeping hold of that uh, control. The, an open standard you know, is, is a complement to that and it enables cross-platform content. But, but you need both because they kind of push each other in a good ecosystem that's functioning correctly, I think, uh, those two uh, uh, complementary proprietary and open standards push each other forward. Now, I, uh, sorry, it's a little self-promotional because I know you work with the Immersive Technology Alliance uh -huh. as well, and uh, I, I think the big question is is why? Like, we, I mean, you, you've got the Kronos that you're involved with. You're involved with Nvidia. Uh -huh. and, you know, I I have to be clear. I work with the ITA as well, uh -huh. um, but why do you do it? He's the boss. <laughs> <laughs> why? So, um, virtual reality. Is a, is a nascent but potentially very significant market. You know, it's going to affect how media gets delivered in all kinds of shapes and forms and devices. Um, but whilst the 
industry is forming in, in this kind of formative, chaotic stage where everyone's kind of trying to figure out how all the bits come together. And I think VR, to be successful, is going to take a constellation of different components and standards to come together and work seamlessly. That's not going to happen by itself. No, nothing ever comes together by itself. You need the industry to be working and cooperating in the appropriate places, co competing in, in the appropriate places. Um, but to figure out what standards we need for interoperability, uh, we need to have good, good open conversations in a safe place to do it. And you know, the ITA is creating a good quorum of the, of the companies that are active in VR so we can figure out where the pain points are and hopefully you know, cooperate in a proactive way to get those pain points solved and then just push the industry forward. Wonderful, wonderful. You're, by the way, on a personal level, he's a tremendous mentor. I've learned a lot from you over, over the years. <laughs> no, really, really. He's, 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 he's my ethics check. And Anyway, thank you so much for, for joining us. No this is Neil Schneider for MTBS-TV at GDC 2015. Thank you for watching. Okay. Thank you.